Hi, I'm Greg Kutsona from Science for the Church. And today I'm talking with Mark Laberton. Mark was president of Fuller Seminary from 2013 to 2022, and now is, of course, president of Meritus. Before that, he was head of staff at First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley. And uh, after uh, before that, received his PhD from Cambridge University. And going back one step previous, he was the college pastor at First Press, where I met him, and uh, that was the beginning of a long-term friendship. Mark is a thought leader and public theologian. He's written several books. The most important, probably, or relevant for our conversation today is The Dangerous Act of Worship. So, Mark, it is such a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks for uh, taking some time today to do. To My do joy, Greg, always. Thank you. Uh, as you know, the context of our conversation is preaching. And so uh, I wanted to start out just by asking, you know, what has your experience been with preaching? Uh, obviously, it's been extensive, but just for the people who are listening, Tell us a little bit about it and uh, what you've experienced as a preacher, and then to what degree you're still active today. Well, this could take the whole of the podcast to just tell you my answer to this question, but I, since I won't do that, I'll just say that my first experience of preaching uh, was as a child in occasionally exposed to Christian preaching, but it was really after I came to faith in college that I began to pay attention to preaching, and then sort of stumbled my way into the discovery of people that I would call master preachers who were like a whole new array of people that I had no idea existed and and were not the people that I saw on television. And they were not the people that were uh, on my radar at all, but they clearly had given themselves to the craft, art, and and vocation, the, the complicated, complex vocation. Of preaching, and so I, certain ones of those people became people that I just regularly followed. This is all pre-internet days, so it was all in the world of cassette tapes and other such things that I would have opportunity, and then exposure at different events or conferences that I might have attended. But it was also then being in the context of church gave me more and more exposure to people who had devoted their life to preaching, and it was clear to me there were people who took that work with their greatest seriousness and others who treated it as pastors in a in more of a secondary or even tertiary way but for the people who made it a, the primary core of their vocation as a pastor it was it was it just ensnared me as a form of reflection theology creativity beauty analysis all grounded in the biblical text and all pointing to the faithfulness of a God made known in Jesus Christ. So it, it then became my vocation, which was a great surprise to me. I had no interest, no anticipation whatsoever that I would end up being a preacher. I've always found my vocation as a preacher to be both compelling and awkward, uh, compelling in the sense that I do believe I've been called to preach awkward because I still find it surprising for various reasons that I'm even a Christian, let alone that I'm a Christian preacher, let alone eventually that I become the president of a theological seminary. These are all things that are as much a shock to me as they are to anyone else. So so it's, and I've been grateful actually for that awkwardness, uh, partly because it keeps me grounded in, I think, the outsiders. I often myself have developed a, a vocation of preaching to always have an ear, I hope, for speaking to the people who are the who are the non-believers or the marginalized or the people who would not see themselves as quote the the faithful few, uh, but pe see themselves in Schleiermacher's terms as the culture despisers of the church, which is why ministry twice in Berkeley was a natural fit for me because it felt like these are my people. This is the kind of cultural set that I have both a heart for and an and an identification with. Um, so, and then it, it broadened. Uh, it broadened as my own understanding of different cultures, ethnicities, uh, contexts around the world, then gave me a completely renewed and ex further extended vision of what 
preaching and preachers are like and how they actually carry out their work. So all of that has just been a, a very long, complicated, rich, sometimes troubling, but mostly actually quite an inspiring story. Mm. Well, I can say that I've uh, heard your preaching for many years and been deeply touched uh, by it. I mean, to get really uh, uh, you know, individual and personal, you, of course, did the uh, the marriage ceremony, our wedding for Laura and me, and I still re recall the things you said at our wedding. So, um, so you have it's 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 really your preaching is very powerful in that way. And you know, I didn't mention this in the intro, but you also wasn't the Lloyd Ogilvie Chair of Preaching uh, at Fuller. That was your first uh, right you know, position at Fuller. That's so right. That probably got you engaged in that partly that uh, learning about other preaching styles as well. Yes, uh, did it have yes. an effect for you, on you personally, would you say? Yes, it did. I, in part because preaching was something I did, not something I had studied. So in fact, when when I was first contacted by Fuller about that position, I said, you know, it's very nice that you would contact me, but uh, I'm, I'm quite sure that I'm not the right person for this job because I'm I'm not really a person who did my PhD in homiletics, which is the study of preaching. Uh, but instead in hermeneutics, which is the study of how to interpret the Bible. And the, clue, the two are obviously very closely connected, but they're not the same. And and furthermore, I'm not really sure that you can teach anyone to preach. <laughs> and so clearly to call somebody who isn't convinced that you can teach them to preach is not a good idea. <laughs> uh, and they said, well, actually, that's part of the reason why we're interested in you, because you don't actually fit a box that, that some might have. So... I was surprised by that. And then that led me to spend the first year that I was on the faculty really trying to understand how how preaching was being taught and how it was being understood, what it was, what the vocation of preaching was, not just the the task of preaching or or maybe the art of preaching, but really what is preaching and and what is and who is the preacher in the midst of all that. So uh yes, it gave me opportunity for rich reflection and an understanding and exposure to so many different kinds of preaching and preachers that I probably wouldn't have paid attention to in quite that way unless I had been on a faculty uh, position. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that just the breadth that that offers you to yes. you know, force to do that kind of work is so enjoyable, you know? Yeah, and, exactly right. Um, yeah. So of course we're particularly connected at science for the church and also through the Calvin Institute of Christian worship grant that, uh, that were funded by at the moment, uh, probably funded by looking at science and technology and the issues yes. present for Christians. So if you were to name a few of those issues, again, from science and technology, what are they? And then, you know, there probably some really obvious ones, but there might be a few stealth issues that uh, we are not taking in yet. So what comes to mind when you think about that? Well, <clears throat> One of the things that we did at Fuller when I was there was to sponsor a conference on preaching in a science-shaped world. And uh, and it was to just lay out the fact that we are embodied creatures who live in a physical and material world, which is gargantuan beyond imagination and which is the most intimate and practical and literally touchable part of our humanity. And, and as a result, science that intersects with that whole array, subatomic to cosmic, is all at play it, continuously, period. And then the question becomes how in a world that's shaped by the empirical method and by the standards of science and by the rigors of science, how does, a, how does preaching a narrative in a science-shaped world actually work. And mm -hmm. so it, it tees up a lot of the questions of how do you deal with the complexities of humanity? How do you deal with the, the, the discoveries of science that help us get a sharper and sharper picture of, of many of the material elements of our human existence while simultaneously acknowledging that, that science doesn't ask or necessarily answer in any way uh, the why questions, uh, the why of processes, yes, but the why of of the substance of of being human, for example, is not a question that science is taken up with. And yet it would be the preoccupation of a pastor to somehow hold on the one hand uh, the realities of science, the dynamics of technology, and the subjectivity, the radical subjectivity of humanness. And 
that's what the preacher is always holding together. And whether we're conscious of that or do it deliberately or not is another question. So some of the issues that come up really do then turn around, what does it mean? For example, uh, just last month, the discovery of the brightest object in the universe mm -hmm. that, uh, that scientists are actually beginning to think perhaps may be the brightest object in the universe, not just the most recently discovered, but possibly the brightest object in the universe. It has actually been in our sights for a long, long time, but it was understood to be a star and it was thought to be relatively distant, but nothing like what it was, which is something like 12 billion years away from us. And it only appears to be a star because it, it rests in the galaxy in the ways that it does, but it doesn't really show us the scope and scale, which would be 500 billion times brighter than our sun <laughs> i mean these are just beyond staggering staggering numbers and so the question of what it means to preach in a in a universe that's that big is is a human shaping question right how do we how do we acknowledge the discoveries of science or cosmologically or genetically as as the genome project came to a close and this genetic research is now uh, de rigueur every day it's shaping every aspect of medicine how do we understand the role of dna and the the ways that it gives us insight into human um conditions but also human uh substance literal substance and and both our pathologies uh as well as our health um how do you cope with that and talk about being a, a full human being in the language of scripture in the image of god in a context in which we are also this kind of matter in this kind of material universe right that's mind-boggling so when it comes to worship for example i think that sets the stage in a magnificent way for a, a, the the humblest of remembrances that we are dust to dust we're right now as we have this conversation in the season of lent and and Lent has always meant to be, has been meant to be a season in which we recover again or, uh, and are reminded again of the character of our human condition in its frailty, vulnerability, finitude, and sinfulness. And, and so how now do we come to a season like Lent with a still more uh, astounding set of insights into our humanity, cosmological or subatomic, that in some ways are uh are setting the table for our worship i find that an extreme challenge now for some people it's it's an alienating challenge right that it it means how could i possibly begin to believe in a god who is is in some sense the maker of the universe when the scale of the universe is behind beyond any kind of human imagination about what 500 billion times the brilliance of the sun even means you can say these words but you have no idea what that actually means right um and yet there we are we live in that we live in that universe and we are we are not billions of years old ourselves we we might get three score and ten and uh and therefore our humanity is really tiny very very tiny and and our dna is to say the least tinier still um so i think you have to have a very robust understanding of creation you have to have a very robust understanding of of a god who can hold all things who in the language of colossians in christ holds all things together that's the firstborn from creation the firstborn from the dead these are these are material images and they are are therefore in the terrain of science but that is in the terrain of human experience and, and knowledge but how we how we understand them theologically so so you take that range for example alone and science is squarely on the table whether we're talking about it because we have a disease or whether we don't or whether we're talking about it because we have some sort of uh concern about a certain scientific discovery we there is no escaping the fact that we live in this kind of a universe and therefore we are desperately needing and great and can be grateful for 
the discoveries of science um, across that whole enormous spectrum of material existence. So, um, so that puts it squarely on the table. And then the question is, can the church, uh, is it going to step toward that reality in all of its awesome, it really beyond imagination kind of reality? Or are we going to just avoid it? Or are we going to blame it as though science is the problem when in fact, uh, beyond science is the question of the universe itself and the nature of human experience uh, for which science is just another very important, but another way of telling the human story. Yeah. So, um, so that, that maybe gets us started in some of the directions that I would tend to think. Yeah. Well, and I think it, uh, what you're saying evokes a strong Labertonian theme, which is the gospel isn't about making great things small, but it's entire. And I'll let you finish the sentence. Well, it was a quotation from Pascal that uh, we should do great things as if they're small because of Jesus Christ. And we should do small things as if they're great because of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a, to me, that is a magnificent way of summarizing the tension and and the hope, the joy, the beauty, mm -hmm. the delight, actually, the playfulness of of what it means to be human. Yeah, I was also thinking. I believe it was your dad who felt like so many religious people make great things small. And uh, yeah, and can you can you uh, recount that? Because I think there's a, also that echo that I'm hearing. Yes, how you see yeah. science. Dad was very much a man of science, and uh, I've jokingly said that he saved certain neck veins for the discussion of religion because he really wanted his two sons to do everything possible to avoid religion. And his critique uh, was was what you just said, namely that it was his observation that, that religious people have an, a particular inclination to take great things and make them small. Mm -hmm. And what he meant by that was, uh, you could take something like the cosmos and and the nature of creation itself and ask all kinds of questions about uh, the theological framing of that, but to try to get it into human manipulable categories, which suggests that the whole thing gets reduced to whether it was in the classic debates of the 1920s, is it a six-day creation or or is it not, right? Um, or Or you take the mystery of what it means to be human. And you reduce it to a small moral category that human existence only matters in moral language, meaning are we people who do good or are we people who do bad? Mm -hmm. And and it's in that context that he said, you know, if you want a capacious life that is a life that has an openness, an engagement, a, um, an, a, a, a discovery, a, an adventure, then you don't close it down with all of these human labels and and honestly over the years dad's insight has just been a tremendously important warning to me there's hardly a day literally that i go by without remembering that because first of all the church does tend to take great things and make them small uh we you know we're talking about the god of the universe and invite people to a balloon party some of the things right. bring yeah. bring in the clowns right <laughs> it's it's just this tendency which is part of our frailty and part of our finitude. And, and some of it is is wonderful. Like what, what are frail, dusty creatures like ourselves going to do with a reality that we couldn't even begin to give language to describe, right? So so on the one level, fair enough, we have to work as philosophers say, as, as philosophers say in the world of middle-sized objects, which is called just normal reality. <laughs> and sometimes therefore balloons and clowns seem like the right thing. But often when we're doing that, we're oblivious to the fact that we have taken something really grand and made it really, really small. Um, and and I think in doing so, then we close off mystery. We close off and try to be reductionist about who God is. God is a series of my theological affirmations about God, my favorite quotes from the Bible, whatever it might be. and And it all becomes this really sad little project of just getting a, a few little ducks in order rather than actually engaging sight falling before the god of the universe i just recently preached on ezekiel one and two at the calvin symposium on christian worship and if any of you who might be listening to this haven't recently read ezekiel one or two uh, you might read that text because it's a text in which 
God appears to Ezekiel in a way that is uh, completely overwhelming to Ezekiel, the prophet, who then just uh, falls on his face and is silent, right? And and I I think it's a magnificent portrait of that's a much better response to just to actually just fall in silence and not not step on it like ooh cool fireworks. <laughs> it's more, <laughs> it's more like I am no I've just encountered a reality that leaves me literally speechless in its glory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about uh, a dinner last night I had we had at our house and it was with faculty uh, primarily faculty from Chico State and two two of the faculty one was, were scientists one a physicist and one a chemist. Uh -huh. And it was so enjoyable. They they started because they're emeritus perhaps and retired and all that that they could just speculate a little bit and they played some science games with us, you know, like for example, if you uh weigh a glass of water and then you put your weigh it and then if you put your finger in it, does that add to the weight or not? Right? Those kinds of things. And then yes, yes. The actual answer is yes, it does add to the weight. But then the why was so interesting. Or if you have boiling water, does it freeze faster than cold water? And the answer is yes, generally speaking, because boiling water doesn't have air, et cetera, which creates a layer of uh, insulation. My point in all this was, as you're talking about this world that science opens us up to, it is a wider world, I think. Yes. And, um, Pope John Paul II said that, like science can open up, open us up to a wider world. So I'm making an echo of that. Yes. One of the things we found in Science for the Church, which which is a great surprise, was in the hundred or so churches that we worked with, we surveyed some of those congregations, and those congregations, the members of the congregation, 86% said when they had projects, initiatives, or you know, classes in science that were part of their church, they grew in faith. Yes. It wasn't that they grew in understanding science, it was they right. grew in faith because right. More of them was coming to more of God's beautiful creation. Right. It is unfolding. That's right. That's right. Well, I do think we, we are finite creatures and we do need to limit our boundaries for the sake of keeping our bearing in the world, right? We we can't just be um lost in space, literally. And and mm -hmm. as a consequence, I do understand the human gravity. We, we are all inclined toward this, just like we're inclined toward entropy. We are inclined mm -hmm. toward smallness. I get that. But to me, that's one of the things about the Christian gospel and the Christian faith in the in the fullest sense of the way that the Bible actually portrays it in scripture, which is that it is it is an all-encompassing reality of all things. Now, when some people hear that, they think, oh gosh, there's it's an oppressive religious regime that's trying to lay its blanket on on, on the material world. And there have been scarring examples of when that's the case. In this case, what I'm trying to say is, no, I'm not trying to put a blanket on anything. I'm saying that that the holder of these extraordinary mysteries and scale and beauty and unknown pieces at every molecular and cosmic level and everything in between is is in the in, in the knowledge and mind and heart of a God, the God who holds all things. And and then the project of being human, the project of being engaged in science, the project of of being a friend, a neighbor, uh, a parent, uh, a scientist, a pastor, a preacher can actually take its own particular place in that cosmic sweep. So there's nothing shutting down about that. And it's nothing oppressive that closes off avenues of thought, compassion, interest, curiosity, et cetera. And it, it makes for a rigorous life if you're going to take it all on, which is precisely what you've been giving yourself to, uh, Greg, for all these years, is this the rigor of actually thinking carefully about matters of faith and science. That's the dynamism. And, and for many people, thats it feels like it's more than they can take on. I understand that. But you don't have to take on the philosophy of science as, as a whole. Uh, you can actually just focus on certain pieces in a legitimate way and not be reductionist and find great ways of growing your faith as you do so. Yeah, yeah, I... Well, I certainly resonate with that. And um, I, I just, it's so fascinating to hear the way you're talking about engaging science in the proclamation of the gospel as a preacher. Um, and I mean, I, I, you you bring your own convictions about the gospel into that, which is, I guess, an obvious statement, but 
probably right. still worth underlining. Yeah. Um, if if you if you were preparing a sermon and you said to yourself, I want to make sure sure I'm going to engage a science or technological issue, or you just said, well, let's just say it that way. It's a little more specific. Like, here's a point where I really want to engage a science or technological issue. Um, how would you do that? Are there writers or thinkers, et cetera, you, you would lean on? And do you think science and technology are easier or more difficult than other topics to uh, integrate into a message? Yeah. Well, let me start by saying, I think we have to decide, as you said, whether the gospel that we worship uh, and, and uh, affirm and seek to live is a gospel that's big enough for reality. Uh, if it's if it's not big enough for all reality, then it's not the gospel. Mm -hmm. And that isn't a way of trying to say the gospel becomes evasive or um, non-particular. Actually, the scandal of the gospel is that it's both particular and universal. Uh, so, so I'm saying that because a lot of how I would approach it then is about not doing so out of fear. Yeah. So I, if I'm going to approach one of these issues, it's not because I believe I'm I'm in a corner, or the church is in a corner, or the the gospel is in a corner. It's it is built for me on that sense that all truth is God's truth. Therefore, there are truths that emerge out of science or out of cosmology or you know out of any particular branch of discovery, genetics itself, which might cause me to have to rethink how I understand the nature of material reality, and therefore the meaning of being human, and therefore the significance of a given biblical text. Uh, so let me try to try to ground this, but not out of not to do so out of fear, but out of a sense of anticipatory discovery and and an ongoing work of integration, right? So AI would be an example recently. So there's a lot of uh, a lot going on, and it will ever more define and consume our life. So that's just a fact. It's it's already there more than we uh, the average person would ever know. And, and can we confirm that you're not AI right now? I am not AI. No, I'm actually, no, I, I thought about doing this as an AI bot, but no, it's, I'm actually Mark Laverton in the physical flesh sitting in a semi-comfortable chair in my house. So, no, I is, want to make sure we have that disclaimer yeah, yeah, in yeah. this moment. Right? It's good to know that. Thank you. Maybe I should always put such disclaimers forward in, at the beginning. Um, so I, let's say I'm going to, I'm thinking about the fact that we, we live in an AI uh, ever more, AI shaped universe. What do I, what do I want to th consider and cause the congregation to consider as we all experience the social transformation of at least the appearance and the growing appearance? That appearance and reality may not be the same thing. Mm. And while that's been true for a long, long time, uh, it's now ever more true. So how do we, how do we think we know something? on what grounds and particularly let's just say what do we think we know about being human so does ai displace humanity does it make humanity irrelevant to the universe does it discount human existence does it change human relationships i think in some people's minds it absolutely does all those things so let me start by saying i think that's the world we live in where for some people uh it does make us less real and less significant for all the various reasons that we could go into. But if I'm going to raise AI questions, I don't want to do it out of out of fear and anxiety. I want to do it out of careful thought. I want to have done some research. I don't pretend to be an AI expert. I'm not trying to become Mr. A technology in that kind of detailed way. But I, I do want to take it seriously because it is among the most important things that are actually happening right now. And if I'm a preacher, trying to speak meaningfully to people who are living in a world that is ever more AI shaped, then I want to lead them in a long conversation about AI, which will come up for years and years to come uh, it is, as any major technological fact does, whether it's implicit or explicit, it will be present in our experience. Therefore it has to be present in our preaching in some way. So, but how do I, what do I want to say about what it means to be human? I can, say something cheap like well of course it doesn't disregard humanity because it's just going to be technology and i'm not technology and humans will always win because god will make sure that's how it turns out well 
<laughs> you know, on one hand, I could say broad frames. Okay. So I, I suppose we could say all those things. And that is some of that at least is true. Um, but the reality, of course, is more complex than that, right? It's not an all or nothing proposition. It's not A or B. It's it's really this ambiguous middle that we're all living in all the time where we, where we want to be able to know certain things in a in a peculiar way. So for example, it certainly is the case at the very least that AI is infinitely more, uh, has infinitely greater capacity than human computation does or any form of computation up to now has. And that's been true of computer technology for some time, but, but with generative AI in particular, it now becomes even more fully the case. So how do I educate myself? How do I take that seriously? How do I allow myself to face whatever questions, and perhaps they are fearful questions at some points about, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what is this going to mean? Um, if God holds all things together, then I can approach this non-anxiously. Um, I can approach it seriously with gravity, but not with panic, as though somehow uh, the God of the universe and the distinct role that I think human beings are meant to have and hold uh, will somehow just be undone by all of this technology. I don't have to. I don't have to run away from it. I don't have to not, you know, fight or flight. I don't have to take either of those approaches. So then I do the more careful analysis, theologically and otherwise. And what is it that I want to say about being human? I want to lift up the the distinctiveness of human emotion, compassion, relationality, intuition, um, empathy that is non-mechanical, that isn't just, uh, this is not like that. And it's not even, it's, it's about the uniqueness of any given person, the mystery of a fingerprint, the mystery of a personality fingerprint, um, the tone of a voice, the, I mean, there's that astounding sense that, you know, the human eye can recognize a person at some considerable distance as a person that we know because we just have internalized the shape of their head mm. and we can see just the back of their head mm. and say, oh, there's my spouse, right? Mm. Uh, or there's my child. That's an extraordinary human capacity. Now, technology will probably get a long, long, long ways down that road as, as uh, is already occurring, um, but it will not have that gaze filled with compassion, with love, with intense um, emotion and concern, with fear. Um, it, it will be, it'll be made up of other parts of analysis, of identification, but not of identity, not of empathy, not of standing inside that person, right? Um, those are things that I would want to lift up and say, this is, this is the mystery of what it means to be human. But then we have to have a much bigger picture of our humanity than than just uh, a small picture of our humanity, which we then understate, we underappreciate, uh, and we we don't really see as the glory that it actually is. So AI, in that sense, promotes, again, going back to understand more of the glory of God, more of the glory of God, what God has made us to be, more of the glory of the natural world, the interaction between the natural world and the human world, um, et, et cetera, right? These are the things that, to me, key up my imagination and make me want to lean harder into this um, because it's with us. And uh, does that, does that make sense? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And I think one of the things that's definitely resonating uh, is the book that you're working on with about fear. Yes. We came up a few times um, and how I think fear can constrict our ability to really embrace this mystery and this, these discoveries. And right. It's interesting. Um, I have a subtle uh, <laughs> plug for your book behind me, The Dangerous. Yes, I, <laughs> <see it there. laughs> um, I probably should just left it subtly you know, on people's minds without them knowing. Thank, it. Thanks, Greg. Thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think those two, I don't know exactly about your the book on fear because that's emerging right now, but there seems to be a common thread in the titles of both books. Like you, it's not. Aslan, that i.e. Christ, is not safe, but good, right? And, right, right. And so part of science, as it fits into that the gospel that comes from the Christ we know, is yes. it's going to it's gonna engage us in a way that we're going to have to put aside our fear, it seems like, or right. 
acknowledge it and say, let's put this fear into the right context of yes. and of, of uh, worship. At least I, right. I, you're the one who's written the, the, the word. So I'd love to hear how it connects with some of the work you're doing uh, on the book right now, or perhaps, and or the book that you wrote on the dangerous act of worship. Yeah, it is interesting even to me that I have written two books that have dangerous in the title and that I'm now writing a book on fear. It, it, <laughs> it is a very interesting thing. In the books themselves, those two books, The Dangerous Act of Worship and The Dangerous Act of Loving Your Neighbor, which in certain ways are a book on the first commandment and the second commandment, um, the danger is that something is actually at risk. That's the primary danger that I'm talking about. And what's at risk in The Dangerous Act of Worship is that it changes our understanding of all power and reorders us uh, into a universe, a life, a reality in which God's power um, is the power that is meant to clarify, define, liberate, set free, reorient, redefine, recreate, etc. Right, and and that, but that does mean that I'm not God. Hmm. Uh, this is why at first press in Berkeley we had a a litany that we had written and used occasionally in worship that began with me saying, "I'm not God," and the congregation saying back to me, "You're not God," and I would say to them you're not God. And they would say, we're not God. And then we would go on and name other things that could be gods in our life and, and name them as not gods. Mm -hmm. Why would we do that? Partly because we carry around a lot of fears based on an assumption of power, rightly and wrongly assessed, uh, about powers and influences in the world to which we feel oppressed or obligated or subjected or whatever we might say. And, and in that array, part of it is how do we calibrate our fear? Mm -hmm. um, and how are we willing to pay the price of the dangerous act of worship that is giving up the, the role that I, as a human being, want to claim, which is that the world is about me. Now, that's a peculiarly Western way of putting it, but it could be who are we that is my tribal group or my community or my subculture or my um, ethnicity, whatever it might be. So so I do think that um, that there is a danger there. The dangerous act of loving your neighbor is the dangerous act of, again, surrendering still further that, that it's only my needs, my priorities, my vision, my understanding of reality, which is real. When in fact, uh, if I understand the nature of my neighbor and dare to listen and even more dare to love them, especially if I, by God's grace, am able to love a person that I don't like or somebody who may even be my enemy, then that's a revolution of a personality and of a, of a reality in the world, which then gives me freedom to actually see the world, not because there aren't enemies, there are enemies, there are dangers, but how do we calibrate the dangers is really the the question. So how all of what we're talking about comes into play then is as we live in a world of fear, and it's at least arguable that the era that we're living in right now could well be dubbed the era of fear, certainly in the United States, but in many, many places around the world. And partly it's, it's driven by all kinds of material, scientific, political, social, economic, racial, gender driven sources of fear. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah, I could turn this into a horror show if I decided <laughs> I wanted to, by just naming the dangers that, that lurk, right? So, but then the question becomes, from a Christian point of view, and then ultimately from a preaching point of view, how do I understand the nature of fear? And how do I calibrate it in a way that is that is tempered by reality? But that reality starts and ends ultimately with the God who is Alpha and Omega, not therefore distantly saying, you know, in some abstract eternity, but in a very immediate sense in the world that I live in. This is the mystery of the incarnation, God present in uh, in finite terms in Jesus Christ. The scandal of that and the scandal of the cross say God fully enters into and identifies with that particularity, which is a world of fears, not least in Jesus' own time, the fear of Roman authority or power or oppression or the fear of disease or the fear of fire or the fear of so many, so many different things. Um, how do we understand our fears? So the book 
is an attempt to name the biology of fear. So there's a fair amount about the science of fear. What, what is the biochemistry of fear in our bodies? But also the science of sociology around social fear, economic fear, collective fears, not just individual existential fears, but collective fears. And how do we understand and live in that world in a way in which we find freedom, which does not mean no fear. It means cal faithful calibration, wise calibration of fear, so that uh, fear, which in some ways could be partly at least defined as, as a crisis of knowledge. What do I think I know about the thing that I think is a danger? And, and when we have a fear instinct, when suddenly we're gripped by fear because of a sound or a shadow or a a sudden movement or whatever it might be, um, we're, we're gripped by the biochemistry is now underway. And the immediate task then is, uh, again, we're given the gift of fear or fight for, to fight or to flee. But, but I do think the other part of it is yes, but also to know. So we're immediately, as we're either fleeing or fighting, we're trying to actually understand what is this danger? And then when it suddenly turns out it was just our cat walking in a funny way that caused us to see a shadow that we hadn't expected, then suddenly we laugh at our fear, right? It's it, it just turned out to be nothing. But sometimes, of course, greater knowledge brings us to still greater fear because then we might realize it is a, a life-threatening danger. Or it could be some other kind of less dramatic danger, but nevertheless a true danger. But we're, the question that is, how do I come to know my fear? Now, to know my fear, I have to actually look at my fear. This is the scariest part of fear, right? If if we're panicked in fear, to actually look at the source of the fear is as much the danger to us as it is uh, as as the thing itself, right? So, and and on what grounds will we do that? This is where, to me, a life of faith is a life that uh, gives us a contextual understanding of our existence in such a way that I am not I am not ever alone in my fear mm. for starters. And I have an advocate, I have a friend, I have a redeemer, I have a God who holds all time, um, life and death and life to come. Mm. So so if the table of my life is really rigorously daily set in that way, then I've known and you've known and people around the world have known extraordinary dangers today, this hour, this minute, somebody that might be listening to this podcast is perhaps in a moment of tremendous fear in their lives for, for all kinds of circumstances. Uh, and I think that the Christian assurance is that whatever those circumstances, there is a deeper reality that may not or may not be present to us uh, or mindful or tangible to us, but which actually holds the danger that, that we might be experiencing and gives us actually resources in community in knowledge in in a fearlessness to actually dare to look into the source of our anxiety uh in ways that that little else could possibly do hmm. well i have one last question for you I mean, i'm a little bit just moved by what you just said because it or maybe more than a little bit but that that idea of living fearlessly and therefore open to what God is doing and faithfully in that sense, it's, it's just a, it's a vision of life I would like to live into more than I do. And when I do, there's beauty and joy, right? Same with me, same yeah. with me. Um, I mean, so I, 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 this is one of those, um, those just open-ended questions. If there's any last thing you'd want to say to, you know, the science for the church uh, types, uh, you know, for the people who will listen to this or view this, who want to bring science into their ministry, particularly into their preaching. Um, I'm going to put out there what I heard was to engage the insights of human knowledge, like science and technology, fearlessly because of the greatness of the God that we know in Jesus Christ. That's what I heard, part of what I heard right. you say. Yeah. You could go, you can riff on that or go a different direction, uh, whatever yeah. you want to close up with. Right. So, and I would distinguish what you just said, which I would wholly embrace from scientism, which is actually making science God or it's the supreme and only final authority. Yeah. Whereas, from I mean, a Christian point of view, science is not to be held in that 
context. It's it's meant to be held as as a vigorous, demanding, important, urgent, valuable, complex uh, incidents of human finitude mm-hmm. being lived out in a context where we don't have all the answers. I mean, again, going back to the quasar that I mentioned, the brightest object in the universe. I mean, scientists were, sh- were astronomers were were clearly embarrassed and chagrined that this thing that they had looked at for all these years and thought was just, you know, something bright were actually pantsed in a way by science that that taught them, in fact, it was this quasar and that it was 500 billion times brighter than our sun. So what is that? What is that story? That's a story of of scientists themselves living out the scientific journey, which means being proven that they're wrong as well as that they're right. Now, that to me is the whole story of science, which then means that scientism, making it absolute and and, and eternal in that sense, <laughs> supreme, um, is a, is far too overreaching a definition of, of the place of science. It's a it's a human fallible exercise, meaningful, and does pursue genuine knowledge. I remember having lunch once with the president of Caltech. And and I said, how would you in shorthand describe the mission of Caltech? And he said, to permanently change knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> after, after I tried not to fall out of my chair by that claim, <laughs> I realized, of course, that he was right, that, that that could be stated in the most audacious way, arrogant way, I mean, or it could be stated in the most audacious way, meaning more the boldness of believing that they are actually changing knowledge and they are actually changing knowledge. So yeah. they're cha- permanently changing our understanding of what is true. And and I think in a way, what is the church's mission? Well, one of the ways you could describe the church's mission is with the same aphorism to permanently change knowledge, knowledge of God, knowledge of our human existence, knowledge of the universe, knowledge of of all things, right? And that that the because the mission of God is certainly uh to bring up the all reality into a knowing of of those things, of God, of his son Jesus Christ, and of the meaning of the implications of that kind of reality that far outstrip any small creedal expression that only only in the most finite way, gives language to the total reality of of God's existence and life. So yes, the courage, I I do think it is about a journey of courage. I do think it's a journey about finding partners in the courage. So I do think, again, Greg, part of what I've always admired about your work and the work of people who are are working constantly in this field of, of faith and science are giving to the church and, and beyond the church is this desire to bring together what is already together in 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 reality it is it is together but in comprehension and formulation and language and structures of ideas uh the the arguments have to be made for how these two things actually really are held together intention often uh and and with clarity about where the priority of of devotion belongs all those kinds of things are part of it but uh, the the Christian faith will only be more relevant and more apparently relevant the more real and truly it is grounded in the in the real world, which includes the material physical world, not just the spiritual world. And then if you have a theology that believes that God's God's creation will be recreated and renewed, but not expunged, extinguished, evaporated, then the, the devotion to the work of science and the long-term stewardship of the earth, the nature of climate change, that could have been another whole line of our conversation. AI is another line. Genetics is another line. All these major streams of science that are so, so important to our actual existence, but also to the authentication of a faith that can vigorously and courageously uh, move toward those discoveries rather than lurking in the shadows or casting stones or uh, simply disconnecting as though a spiritual reality and affirmation is the only thing that God is interested in. When it would seem to me the God of the Bible has shown himself to be a God who, who is interested in the whole shoot and match and not just in things that we would 
partition off as spiritual. Mm. Oh, well, it's impossible to end this conversation. I know we will continue it, but for the yes. moment, I will put a pause in it and just really thank you for your insights and for the ministry that you have, which I'll just focus on in this case of preaching and of bringing the gospel with this incredibly capacious uh, and fearless vision that you have. So, Marks, thank thank you so much for this time. Thanks so much, Greg. I I hope to live into this vision I'm describing. I'm an, I'm a learner myself, believe me. So I'm very aware that there's a long arc here. And uh, I've been delighted to be with you today. Thanks so much.